Hi, I'm Keegan Allen, and you're watching my episode of Lip Roll with Valerie Morehouse. Welcome to Lip Roll. I'm your host, Valerie Morehouse. And I'm your co-host, Ella London. Good morning, Miss Ella. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm good, but I'm like... I'm just loving the new yellow. Thank you. There's always yellow. And that now we're the bumblebee, like we always are backstage. Black and yellow, black yeah, and black yellow. Black and yellow. I you love look it. gorge. I love it. So, um, and I was, I was just thinking this morning about when we first met, because that was when I was really starting out my yellow journey. You were. In two, and um, it was 2008, 2009. Right. Um, right after I got married. But now you're mixing it. You're not mixing it up anymore. When no. I met you, you'd have a little bit of black and yellow. And yeah. now you're constantly yellow. That's all we have. Yeah, it took a while to build that much. But you're my vocal coach. You, Yes. That's how we met. Uh, that's how we you met. You helped me with my music video. That's and right. it was great. And now all these years later, we're sitting right here. That's right. And you, so, yeah, it's like, whoa. <laughs> it's, where did it go? It's been like almost 10 years, right? Yeah. It's, it's, crazy. You know, it's been over 10 years, I think. I think we hit our 10 year mark. Oh we God. need to go celebrate. The time is just going by so fast. So everybody yeah. just slow down and be in the moment. That's, be in the yeah, moment. Serenity now. And speaking of the moment, who yes. do we have on today? We have Keegan Allen. Uh-huh. Yay! Yay! I know we always say yay, yay! but I'm always so excited, so excited. for every single guest. So yeah, so, so there's so much I don't know about him because there's so many things that we do with clients and I do with clients and I don't know, you know, a lot of their personal journeys. And so this is where I get to kind of discover because we're always working and singing, right? Yeah, it's like, it's like, you know, work, sing, work, sing, and now we get to chat and have I know. some fun. I can't wait. All right. It's well, going to be great. Let's take a listen. Let's listen. So Keegan, welcome to Lip Roll. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad we finally did it and you made it. I know yeah. it's been, it's so hard to get all these actors and my, my clients and my singer schedules going. So we really appreciate you being here. Of course. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm glad. I know you have a lot going on. Yeah. So we have a lot to talk about, but there's okay. also a lot that I don't know about you. Yeah. So I want to discover. So we're just going to discover okay. a bunch of things. Um, okay. So what have you been doing lately? I know you came in recently to work on some music, but you're, mm -hmm. you're doing multiple things right now. I am, yeah. I just had my, my second photo book come out last year. I was doing a world tour. Um, I also, you know, I'd shot a movie uh, at the end of last year, and I was doing, the reason that we kind of reconnected is you go through the circuits and you get a, uh, there was a project that I was very passionate about, and it required singing, and uh, ultimately, I think they ended up going with a singer that could act instead of an actor act that, that could can sing. sing. Right. But uh, it was still interesting to me to rediscover my voice. And every time that I've I've met with you uh, over the years, I felt that um, it's not just about singing. But I have a whole other side of me with music that I really uh, it really it sparks an inspirational thing. But for some reason, I have noticed my music is, is it comes out of such sadness, like, or such, <laughs> such despair. And then I'm like, Oh, I love playing music. Like I love like, you know, but I think it's good because it's a, for you, it's very different for some artists. They're trying to get to an outcome. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've, I've noticed with clients and with singers or actors is people that are committed to the process. And you're very committed to your process, mm -hmm. which you do it because you love it or you find it interesting. And I think good things come out of that, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and it, it, it's very, it's, it's almost like an investigation of yourself. And it's right, a lot of people are looking for this outcome in in any forum that they are in or any craft. And right. I was always looking at it as, a, as an outlet. Right. Um, and, uh, and so part of me was never like too professional about it until mm -hmm. I had met you and then I was like, uh oh. But then, also, you showed me something else, and we, we've spoken about this at length, but it's not about, you have to believe that you can do it, right. because you can, right. and uh, even if you don't think that you can, your your limit is far farther than you think it is, mm -hmm. uh, and for me, it was a lot to do with my range or the way that I was working my voice, but uh, after dealing with so many years of vocal coaching and VPS and all of that stuff to come to you as it was a real wake up call of what it meant to be a sing a singer right. or, or an actor that right. could sing or whatever that is. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it's hard, right? It, because you're as an actor, 
you know, I, I'm t- working on a movie right now um, that is I can't talk about, but right, yeah. we have a lot of those. We never can um, talk we about can't any talk of about the projects anything, we're doing. By the way, sorry guys, <laughs> sorry for our listeners, but we will divulge as we go, and mm-hmm. we will have some of these people come back on and talk yeah. about the pro- projects that we can't talk about now. Mm-hmm. But it's been really eye opening because my leading actress, um, she's an Academy Award winner. She mm-hmm. is a beautiful wow. actor, um, but she said to me the other day, "I've always thought of myself as an actor that that can kind of sing." Mm. And she has a really nice voice, you know, and so it's just about finding the right teacher and building on those skills. Yeah. So because you started out, did you start out singing or start out acting? Because I don't know that backstory. Yeah, Tell me a so little bit about that. The same kind of thing. I, I always I was first and foremost, always an actor. I loved photography first. And then I became uh, this kind of like I was into editing and into cameras and gear and all that stuff. And, and I as, do know that because I still have your book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Life, Love, my, Beauty, my yes, first book. Yeah, exactly. Um, on my coffee table in my studio. I love it. That's yeah. so great. Thank you. Um, and uh, as I was doing all these editing things and photography stuff, I would notice that uh, I would edit some of my friends' acting reels. Mm-hmm. And I'd be like, uh, I could do this. <laughs> and then I went the little in. voice. I got this. Yeah, I was like, I could do, I could actually do this. And my father was, was a very thespian actor. He was yeah. a Broadway actor and oh, he nice. did a lot of Shakespeare and he did a lot of um, touring theater. Uh, well, now that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, he did He did a, a cool um, play by, uh, I can't remember, it was Jason Miller. Jason Miller, okay, Exorcist. Yep. Uh, he wrote a, a play called uh, That Championship Season. My father toured with that. So growing up around that, it made me even more inclined to follow this passion Mm -hmm. because I'd always respected him and had a reverence for the work that he was able to accomplish. And my mother being an impressionist painter, it was was surrounded by this collaborative effort at all times. So you have a lot of, of, um, you know, art behind you. Correct. With your folks. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and they were very supportive. So that support group, uh, pushing me further into the arts. Um, I came to a crossroads in my, uh, before the, my my formal theatrical training, I came to this crossroads of where I was like, I wanted to actually be a, th- a therapist, like a psychologist oh, in medicine. That. And th- and then there was another part of me that was like, well, if I go to medical school, if I go down this journey, uh, I can always be an actor. But my parents were like, you should choose what you really want to do and right now it, and go force. for it full force. Great like, advice. don't be like, oh, I'm going to do this just because it's a safer bet. Um, but at that point I, I chose to become an actor and I, I went and did conservatory. I got my bachelor in fine arts. I started Where'd you to, go to conservatory? I went to AMDA okay. uh, and I went and did a couple, I did a semester at Carnegie Mellon. I went and I traveled in different places and I uh, worked with, you know, Larry Moss and so many amazing, Larry, uh, he's Larry. a legend. He's a legend. Yes. What uh, was it? Larry Moss, Howard Fine. I yes. did Howard Fine, Howard his Fine's master amazing. class. And then Nancy Banks the other one? is incredible. Yep. And Nancy's like, helps me with so many roles and so many things. Uda uh, Hagen. I did Uda so Uda, Uda, Uda Hagen before she passed. Yeah. She had her little puppy in there and she would just smoke indoors the whole, yeah. the whole day. And we would just breathe all that in and still, you know, it was fine because it was Uda. <laughs> Yeah, right? exactly. So. <laughs> it's the most incredibly affluent air that you could ever exactly, breathe. Exactly, yes. Um, but uh, working with all these people and going forward in my career and, and you know, booking a show that was so uh, right off, mm-hmm. not, not right off the bat, there was... St- I want to make it really clear, especially to listeners, there was a huge period of time in which I still, even with all of these diplomas and accolades from school and things that I moved forward with and a huge support system Mm -hmm. that nothing happened. I was still an actor that was like, what am I doing and why am I doing this? That's so hard. Yeah. That's so hard. And so music to come around to the the answer here, music was this outlet for me (laughs) and uh, I was never formally trained. I listened to Bob Dylan. So you're going to be like early Bob or late Bob, early Bob. (laughs) Oh yeah. I guess so. Like, and both, I guess at the same time, late, Bob Dylan was really I- important to me like together through life uh, so amazing even though he uh, every step of the well, way I have a I have a hold that thought I have a little <laughs> digression story here so okay. I've worked uh, a lot over the years with TV um, uh, with T-Bone Burnett for those of oh, you that don't know T-Bone, T-Bone he's Burnett. An amazing, amazing producer and uh, you know, he's my guy. I like him and we, we work well and he hires me for a lot of projects and um, 
and there's a lot of trust there, which is great, um, but maybe some a little bit too comfortable because I remember when I worked on Nashville, we were in the studio and he was playing me some Bob Dylan. We started talking about Bob Dylan. I said, mm. I just never, I, I get his art and his poetry, but I just don't understand him as a singer because I'm such a singer's singer. Mm -hmm. So he was playing me things that he had done later in life. And he goes, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. And then he went all the way back to you know, when he first started his career and his voice was so pure and he played mm. me some tracks that I had never heard before, you know, yeah. and I think I told T-Bone one of the, one of the tracks he played me that were older, one of the older records where, you know, he was a little older, maybe not taking care of his instrument and his body as much. I think what I said to him verbatim is, you know, that's just nails on a chalkboard for me. Yeah, there and it is. And then I realized, yeah. oh my God, I just said that's T-Bone Burnett about Bob Dylan, you know, <laughs> I couldn't get it back in my mouth fast enough, but he was f great and he laughed and he took it and stride and then he gave me a, m a major education on bob dylan you know yeah. that, that i hadn't really explored so it was a real a real treat yeah but he's one of the greats yeah and as and as a young as as a young man when i was growing up and and really exploring poetry and like being in this like very almost like i want to say i was like very french avant-garde i smoke cigarettes don't get upset i smoke cigarettes in my in, when i was like in my early teens and don't smoke cigarettes because it's really bad and don't eat sugar there um you go. A little disclaimer i, I would listeners. sit like very french and like read poetry Poetry and like a dream. I you was were that in guy, Montmartre, like, uh, like in like near the uh, the under sitting underneath the Arc de Triomphe and like being like so affected and like I'm an artist <laughs> and I'm like have painted black fingernails and like looking at Robert Maplethorpe like photos and like being like I need to be like more like I need to rasp your voice for me, you know, going through that moment. But I discovered Bob Dylan through his writing, his poetry, because when you're going through all those things as a young man especially in an industry that's like very much about rejection, very much yes. about like, hey, guess what? Yeah. You're not good enough. Yeah. Bye. And yeah. you're like, well, wait, I've, I've done everything <laughs> that you wanted in there. This No. So I would go into this introspection of, of that would take me down this dark road of poetry mm -hmm. and positively fourth street or, or, or one too many mornings or, or the, or just like a woman going through a breakup, listening just like a woman. It was like, mm -hmm. it would make me, it would make me feel an emotional stability that I had never found before a nostalgia for something I had never experienced. Right. right? And so unfortunately I got, I got attached to the poetry and then through that, the voice just didn't bother me. It was like, it was like a spirit speaking kind of album and uh and it never really was about music it was about like what's going on and so and to get even more geeky i was very into stereo like stereo equipment and sonically pleasing stereo equipment like tube amps mm -hmm. and uh, I got really into like, uh, you know, going over to my, my, my manager has this incredible sound system. And so I'd go over there and it was immersive. So I could mm -hmm. sit and listen to Bob mm -hmm. as if he's in the room, mm -hmm. um, or, or Neil Young or right. Van Morrison. Now right. Van Morrison is his voice to me after listening to Bob Dylan was almost angelic. It was the most sonically diverse voice. And when I saw what he looked like, I, I listened to Van Morrison for, I think, six months before I like looked up what he looked like. Right. And I was like, uh, right. It He's didn't match. Not I know. Irish. Yeah. No, yeah. like, no. no, no, no. I like imagine him as this like soulful old, like black man, yeah, just no, like this no. very <laughs> soulful voice. And then I was like, who is this man? Um, and, and he's like this like, <laughs> rough kind of like Irish man. Yeah. Um, which is another thing that really like tr tricked me into to seeing a new side of music that it's not always like music. The sound of the voice isn't always what you perceive. Right. Um, so same thing like when you uh, when i listen to reeve carney who's a friend of mine uh, or Zane. we had reeve on the show oh really reeve's not, he was our first episode oh right? there it is yeah perfect he, he's he's, a, he's one of those I, people. Oh, no, one of them maybe second i think yeah he was second yeah like his voice like to me like him and him and his brother and his sister too like they all have that thing where when they start they get on stage they become a different person and well, i love that it's funny that you said that because traveling back to what you were saying i always tell my clients it's about the art mm. it's about talking on pitch and telling your story like a poem mm. it's it's not about sounding pretty or being beautiful. You know, <clears throat> this uh, similar actress that I'm working with was working with a woman, a vocal coach at Juilliard, and I was only supposed to be, you know, helping out with the production here in LA while the person's in LA, and it turned into this much bigger thing because I think she realized very quickly that um, this was not servicing her because everything was in this very light you know, breathy sound. And I said, but that's not really singing and not mm -hmm. even opera. I won't let my classical singer sing like that Yeah, because you're not communicating anything real. 
you know, it has to be coming from a spoken place on key or on pitch. Right. Not, you know, the people that come out and sing, oh, say, I'm going, ah, stop, the, you know, the madness. That's not really how we communicate. Right. As artists, whether you're, you know, uh, Andrea Bocelli or uh, Josh Groban, all the way yeah. down to pop, rock, soul, R&B, that's not how we, we relate as singers. Mm -hmm. So it was really interesting that you said that about the poetry. Yeah. You know, and Reeve, I remember training him for oh, quite a while before I had seen him on stage. And he's such this, you know, lovely, nice, shy person. And the first time I went to a show and saw him at the Troubadour and he just morphed into this beast. Totally in front different of my person. Eyes. Almost like, just who it, is this guy? It, it, it was amazing. amazing. Transformative. That's and that's a real artist. Yeah. And because of that, that's how I found you is because I was just like, how do you do like, how do you do that? And yeah. he's like, oh, well, I have a really like he, he was, very, you know, it's, it's funny about someone like Reeve. If, if you know Reeve's music, if you were able to go through his like his full timeline of music from when he was originally with Reeve Carney and the revolving band and then he right. you know goes to Carney and then he's now on Broadway again I think which I just saw him yesterday we're Amazing. skyping for Hatestown there you go and, and we're so trying to get him through eight shows a week he's such a humble man he is and he he you know someone like him he could have that like that personality like that that egoic personality be like yeah man i'm just like the greatest in the world yeah but he i doesn't. think he's the greatest i think he's the i don't greatest know why too. he's not a, like a household but, name yeah no but I, the, the thing is that he's so humble about how he is able to he doesn't take all he really rarely takes the credit for the work he's put in he he, he like yeah. pushes other people and he says you know the reason that i am able to do this is because of valerie or because mm -hmm. of this or mm -hmm. because of that and like i have this because of that and, mm -hmm. and he, he's very humble and he's also very um th that that was one of the reasons why i found you is because mm -hmm. i was like well I'm more, i want to like work on my music and like stop being so shy about stuff and i also had to like perform in front of four thousand people in binghamton <laughs> new york and i was like what am i That's gonna not do daunting at all yeah i was just like <laughs> i don't know what to do i only sweet yeah. sing these sweet little like love songs which i i think we both kind of talked about how it's like spoon feeding somebody ice cream like they can only take so much of it yeah, you <laughs> until have to, you have, have to, a dynamic you have to broaden your horizons vocally and you have to understand what you have in your toolbox and you have to learn how to use those tools right, right. i think that's so important and and um so you released a single inside day yeah and inside. and another one before that a million miles away as okay. well inside day was recently um and it was with a different producer and it's so interesting to see how like different producers really render a completely different sound between they do. Uh, even if you have the same ideas like you could do a, the uh, the same song with the same exact chords the same vocal dynamic everything right. and take it take it to like three different producers and you will have three completely different songs 100 mm -hmm. percent um that's why there's so many producers now and so many albums right yeah. and so many different the records on the albums mm -hmm. we used to call them records i don't know i, I still don't that's still a mystery to me but i now still call them records too yeah they, albums, they, it was an yeah. album and then or a record was the same thing but now a record is a single mm -hmm. on an album so just so if people for you know my generation are confused <laughs> that might be listening um an album is a full record now and Correct. a record is a single or a track on that record yeah it's so different but yeah it is it's 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 very um uh, very different with different producers, very different styles. And I think that's yeah. why we're seeing more and more producers working on, I just finished a project with a band. We did six weeks in the studio on their album. And I think I probably vocal produced in there with maybe seven different producers. Mm. So it was just a different wow. one for every song. Yeah. And, and we never used to work that way. You yeah. hired a producer and they produced the whole album. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And I, I've ha I had an experience with meeting with a bunch of producers for, doing a uh, million miles away which was the first song and then meeting and meeting with a bunch for uh, inside day and i ended up uh choosing the producers that were able to really strip down the sound because i had a a very specific idea of i like my music to feel intimate i like to feel i'm really into damian rice he's like my oh, favorite he's, amazing. he's my favorite of all time like i could sit and listen to damian rice and some people are just like i can't it's like elliot smith to some people they're yeah. just like I, I need the sunlight for just a minute yeah it's or, or like radiohead um, Love but, Radiohead, though. Yeah, like yeah. Tom York and Damian Rice and um, you know Elliot Smith were huge influences on my musical construction. Mm -hmm. Like because I, whenever I write, whenever I'd write music, I would look mm -hmm. at someone like Elliot Smith who was able to change a chord every single time that he spoke, almost every single, almost like 
explosive that he made. It was right. like a completely different chord change. So that mathematical mathematical equation and formula switched when I was into Bob Dylan music, which was very much math, mathematical in the way that he was like, here's C, then we go to G, and then we go to C. But then I got into this whole different soundboard of music that you know was employed by such bands like Radiohead and mm-hmm. Elliot Smith and Damien Rice. Um, but the other thing about these three uh, artists and is that they all kind of fell into this category of they weren't afraid of like ex- of of bringing to the surface exactly what they were feeling in the moment and they didn't care because they knew it was relatable to someone somewhere else. well they're coming from it they're 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 being an artist from the inside out right rather than the outside in correct it's like what am i i have to do something or write something that's going to elicit a response no 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 you just have to write your truth and right. sooner or later that will be the smash you know yes. that will be something that's very very different on the radio so yeah mm-hmm. and that's what billy eilish i think today is like she's she's an interesting person to me and very very inspirational in the fact that she's she's her she's like who she is and she's like has this interesting voice and she's very young she's so young and has like this huge following and has the ability to go into that pop monster machine and be like i'm just gonna follow whatever is important but she's doing her own kind of thing so but back when i wish that that existed when i was a kid because i would have been like oh that's okay to be myself but at the time there was nothing like that so i that's stayed right. in the classics i stayed where i felt comfortable and mm-hmm. i st- and, and followed around like people like reeve and zane and and watched you know live music all the time and went and saw van at santa barbara bowl and i could swear that he was singing in the garden to me but then i turned around and i was like oh there's five thousand other people here i'm so embarrassed <laughs> um, <laughs> well it is you want to have that listen you want to have that response and and one of the things that has been something that we've been talking about with a lot of guests recently because most of my guests are not just actors but primarily singers and musicians Mm -hmm. they um this conversation of all of the 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 background vocals and the padding and and the auto-tune live and all the rigs and everything that i'm trying to pull out because this generation really wants to hear something that's perfect on the record it almost creates to me a two-dimensional experience on stage rather than a three-dimensional experience. Right. And I think we, I talked about this with one of my other artists um, just recently where you can't have that experience. You know, you feel like they're singing to you because they're really singing. Mm-hmm. There's not like a sheet of plexiglass saying, I'm going to sing everything and put on my show and do my job and then go to the next, you know, city. Mm-hmm. They're really in it. And, yeah. and I think we're missing that. I think that, that a lot of these artists were missing that. And and back in the day before we had all that gear, it was okay to make a mistake or to not sound perfect because it was live. Right. You know, right. so so I would love to bring more of that back. And I know that that's been a, a string, um, you know, sort of a thread topic throughout some of these interviews. And it's nice to hear somebody um, a little younger still talking about having that experience. Yeah, I always you know? feel like, I mean, someone that's really able to bridge that gap from the young to to, uh, for, for young people today is John Mayer to me yeah. that he's he's taken to I mean obviously I'm sure that there was a lot in it for himself to be like oh my god this is such a gift to be able to play with with the, with the Grateful Dead with Bob Weir um, and uh, and get on stage Mickey Hart and all this like amazing this amazing sound and back when like Steve Kimmock was with Further and all this stuff I, I follow the dead by the way I follow the dead like to, 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 it's a nauseam I'm like obsessed with them I would not I have known that I have every <laughs> single, I have every single album um, or record, uh, vinyl. Do they I listen. Still, are they all still? They still release. Released? Like they released Cornell seventy seven recently, which is arguably the best uh, fi- um, mountain uh, Scar- Scarlet Begonias into fire uh, ever. And st- I, was like I highly only, disputed for a long time that it wasn't real. <laughs> um, I only went to one dead concert grateful dead concert back in my 20s this Mm -hmm. would have been a long long time ago um and i remember people just setting up tents and camps it was the craziest thing i'd ever seen and so i wasn't really into it but i appreciated being there you know just to have the experience and somebody handed me a little tab of acid or something and Ooh. i and in that moment i thought you know i'm good i don't really need to see walls breathe i'm just going to try to soak in the experience and, yeah. and that was the responsible you know sort of smart, smart thing at the time but then i was bored out of my mind so i oh, don't know oh so it's interesting they, they have that joke about they're like they're like who knows uh, what i should have done yeah no it's funny it's like it, it's like the joke about the grateful dead is like the music sounds it sounds only it sounds terrible if you're sober or something but i got to tell you I, ever since i've started to understand 
like why their music was so interesting it was because it could be a train wreck one day right, and it totally. could be amazing the yeah, other because yeah, there was yeah, yeah. no auto tune there was no they they were counting each other in and they were merging songs they were like a jam band yeah and now to have john involved in it with mm -hmm. dead and company and touring and like br breathing mm -hmm. life into something that you know so many people had no idea you know, they knew it existed, but they were like, oh, that's dad's thing or that's like grandpa's thing. Right. Now it's like, oh, I'm going. There were some kids at the, the gym. They're like 19. They're like, we're going to the Den company in June. And I was like, huh? <laughs> so it was really great. But but growing up and hearing those albums and like being attached to Jerry Garcia and like yeah. hearing them go through these like, you know, go through the 80s and like right. have that, you know, even Aretha Franklin, like going through the 80s and hearing that like Motown sound go into this electronic this, thing this is my generation i miss the 80s i miss yeah. the 80s i it mean it's fun. anything from like flock of seagulls to Amazing. morrissey to you know to oh, new morrissey. order so incredible my whole thing was new order the pet shop boys i liked anything electronic anything dance that was where i was you would you would find me yeah and i still have that stuff on my spotify that's just turned into sort of edm yeah, you know, that's right. Music and it, it's it's the same as it was, but it's not. It's a mm -hmm. little bit different. So it's fun to have to have gone through all those decades and, and listened to that different kind of music. But yeah, yeah it was groundbreaking, right? Yeah, 1984, it was. 1984, Yeah, and so you know, going through all that and finding music as this outlet, I was like going through life and having photography and acting be like this. Well, having acting be like the spearhead of my artistic career mm -hmm. but then also having the the ability to you know have photography when i wasn't acting so the other hobbies you have other interests so it's not like if this doesn't work because yeah, you can't do acting all the no, time no and i still feel like i'm filling myself up mm -hmm. right i'm yeah. filling my cup up internally with other things that i enjoy and that i'm good at right and i think if you're gonna survive in this business i love that you talked about that and you have all these hobbies because in this business um you have to have other things that make you unique and yeah, fill you'll just you up. drown. You yeah. just, it's, it's imagine being in the ocean, okay? And you have okay, you're, a, you're acting. Well, if you, a storm hits, you don't have anything. Yeah. You need to be able to swim to another boat mm -hmm. and have something else, especially in this craft. Right. Singing, I feel like is singing is a different thing because you can acting is a little bit harder because you have to have a showcase you have to have somewhere to like put you up that's right um as a singer i feel like it's just as competitive but you could do open mics you can go out there and like hit the circuits you can like find a place to perform mm -hmm. uh and it's not so daunting because with acting you're always using some you're mostly using someone else's material you can write your own stuff which is what i'm now doing and developing it's a lot harder um, though and it's a, different a lot way. harder yeah because yeah. then you need you have a lot of cooks in the kitchen whereas right. With singing, I've I've found you you're the cook in the kitchen, and you have your producer who's like kind of like helping you do we it. We all have to kind and of then, fall into what your vision is, as yeah. opposed to yeah, everybody having a voice, you yeah. know. And sometimes that's good, and sometimes that's not good. Yeah. yeah, and talent is sometimes for me. I've seen now is talent is just aggressively attacking what you want mm -hmm. and going for it and believing you can do it. It's, 100%. it's not, it's not something that you like just, I mean, of course there's some people that wake up and they're like, Oh, I'm Freddie Mercury. <laughs> Excuse me. Whoops. Sorry. Excuse me, everybody. Let me just hit this note. Um, yeah. but, uh, but for the most part, if you want to do this, if you find someone that believes in you, like, like, like a Valerie, Mo like Valerie Morehouse, honestly, you. if you find like it. for real, I mean, it was a real oh, eye opening thing for me to be able to, to try and sing some of these songs that we were working on. Yeah. I was like, I can't hit this note. And then I like went home and I like, after we warmed up and I did yeah. another warm up and I did another warm up and I was like, huh. And then I hit it and I was like, wait, what? What? Well, yeah. Why is this now so simple and I've only done it four times? Well, this is what I've been telling people for decades now. <clears throat> it's it's like health or fitness. You can have a really, really, really good trainer. You can have somebody that's decent. You have somebody that's subpar and you can have somebody that's bad. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be able to weed through those people in mm -hmm. any profession, whether it's a doctor or a trainer or a vocal coach or um, you know, a voice teacher, however you want to break that down, a patho speech pathologist. And one of the things that I always tell people is singers are athletes, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have two vocal cords like I have two vocal cords, like everybody else has two vocal cords. And if they're healthy and you keep yourself in decent shape, you can train those muscles to do anything you want them to do, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. you can have someone train you poorly and you could be pulling too much muscle and never get beyond your first bridge. Or you could be uh, with a classical musical theater teacher that doesn't 
understand the contemporary and they're having you sing too breathy, you'll never get your core strong, right? Mm -hmm. Your your mix in the singers is your core. Mm -hmm. And so once you can teach someone to do that, you you live from the inside out. You live from the stomach out, right? right? Yeah. If we're talking about the body, yeah. you can do anything vocally. And yeah. so when you, you have a baseline, you have a beautiful baseline, you have a beautiful voice, you just need someone to help you walk down every path and use all those tools. And then it becomes actually pretty easy. Yeah. So I always liken it to seeing a client that says, I said, well, what if I came in and you said, hey, I haven't done this before, but I really want to run a marathon, you know? And I look at you and I say, you know, Keegan, you should just stick to five miles. It's 25 is or whatever marathons t today or a triathlon. It's going to be too, too intense for you. You'd look at me like I was nuts yeah. and you'd find another trainer. Right. Well, any teacher that puts you in a box when, or if you put you yourself in a box, that's, you've got to turn and move directions. Yeah, yeah. You have to train and you have to tr learn how to train the voice and let someone guide you. So mm -hmm. that you understand where all those resonant spaces are and you can sing the phone book. Yeah. You know, basically. I agree. Yeah. And that and that works with acting as well. That's why like I immediately went for people that, that could see the summit with me instead of being like, yeah, I mean, you don't, having someone that's like lukewarm that, because mm -hmm. we all need to consistently like keep, this is what I was going to ask you actually is like, do you ever feel like, you, or do you have a mentor or someone that, that helps you sharpen your craft because how because otherwise then if you are the like at the top of your game which right. i assume you are i mean right. i know you are wh what does that look like for just real quick i went ice skating with um with maya who she just won the gold medal with her brother for um wow. for ice skating right and i asked her i'm like you're the best in the world so like what does that do to, to your goals like what does that do to your like your life like who do you now go to for right. this and it was really interesting to hear that she was just like oh you know i'm always just getting i'm always trying to get better and yeah. i'm like well if you're already the best then what is that and she's like yeah but i mean you're always getting better well you so, could be auto correcting within your own body as well mm -hmm. you know i love that question and it's funny because i think about that often i've talked about it with people often mm -hmm. but i've never actually been directly asked the question yeah. so i'm excited to answer and here's my answer I'm not going to lie with all humility. It's a struggle for me mm -hmm. only because when you are at a certain level, you do need to find other people and surround yourself by people who are better than you, smarter than you. And as you get to the top, let's say anybody that thinks that they know everything is, is, um, not emotionally sophisticated enough mm. to understand that it's all about what you don't know. You don't know. So the older you get, the more wise you get, the more you realize you don't know anything because there's so much more to learn because your brain is so much more expansive. You've had so many more experiences. But one of the things that is tough for me is I have to respect not just the training, but the individual themselves. And so to find that person that really understands the, the human element and understands who they are and is comfortable with who they are and is training in the same way that I am, it's, it's, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. There are a couple people that, you know, I would maybe two out of all the vocal coaches and teachers I know throughout my, my career that I would feel comfortable having them walk me through a warm up. But to be honest with you at this point, I just experiment within myself and I make those adjustments myself. I just mm. know what they are. Cause I know enough about the voice to make the adjustments. Yeah. I also align myself with a lot of surgeons. So a lot of ear, nose and throat surgeons Very who I cool. work with my clients on. And we have these like crazy nerdy discussions about the voice and the anatomy and what we can do. And then I kind of take those discussions and I throw it into my own singing. And that's how I grow as an artist. Um, and I just kind of know how to do the warm up well enough that if I ever did get need to get back out and sing something, I would sort of know, know where I'm at, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that would be, that would be great. But m my point of that in my career now is reaching out to people that are not voice teachers, but going beyond that, like physicians and doctors yeah. and people who are dealing with major surgery and, um, going into a, like a different realm. Mm -hmm. And I love that you talked about earlier about the doctor, because I actually thought that I might if I didn't do this, I'd want to go to medical school. Yeah. I'm fascinated by it. Same. So if there's something yeah. about a, a person who has an artistic brain, they, they do travel in those, those, um, lines of, of, of either business or medical. Mm -hmm. So if you read about people who are very artistic, they're also very into medicine as well in some bizarre way. It's so really I found weird. That yeah. Interesting that you said that, but I don't know if that answered your question. No, but it did. That's great. It's, it's difficult. actually, it's exactly the answer I wanted to hear actually, because you, you're, you're doing something that's 
really interesting is you went into a, a like you said a realm that you know like no one else i don't feel like i would have guessed that but that's like the the, the logical next step is mm-hmm. to go into the, the like there's a concatenation of like learning in which you go Ooh, like that was okay a good word. i'm gonna <laughs> I'm, a, I'm gonna i'm like a walking thesaurus everybody's <laughs> like what does that mean and I, I we have to say that again concatenation concatenation it, it, as you go through all of these levels of learning right you, you're you yourself are now at this at this stage where you just you say like you can't admit that you know everything that's no. not possible mm-hmm. so what's the next logical step it's to go to the side of absolute information Mm -hmm. which is usually like the Mm -hmm. medical or scientific side which is so smart and interesting and that's why i will always go to valerie morehouse for real you you have to branch (laughs) out you have you can't stay in your bubble yeah and if i were just to reach out to other teachers I would still be in somewhat of a bubble. Yeah. Where am I going to go? I'm going to go somewhere I've never been before with a body. I'm going to go to a physician, a doctor, an Eastern doctor, a Western doctor. Mm-hmm. I'm going to learn about singing that way. I'm going to learn about, you know, Dr. Zytels, who's at Mass General, you know, who's working on, you know, Botox and uh, this this gel that you can now inject. It's not FDA approved yet, but mm. you can inject into the vocal cords to make them phonate better. Um, so I'm into the, the, the frequencies and the science science and the gear that you can do to hook up to a person's voice. I'm into the anatomy. I'm going to glom onto that and I'm going to pull that information into my career as well. So it's that trifecta. So you're, oh, that's how I learn. So that's great. That answered the question. I'm curious. Um, I want to change gears here for for a minute because there's a couple things that I know you were on a show called pretty little liars. Yeah. Um, I I did not watch the show, but I know that it was very, very popular for, Mm -hmm. for quite a long time. Um, and you played Toby Cavanaugh, yeah. right? What was that experience like and how did you land that role? Was that, a, that like one of the biggest roles you've ever had and how did that come to, to pass? Yeah. Um, so it was, uh, I was kind of just a struggle, struggle. I mean, I don't want to say struggling actor, was but I was a struggling actor. It was a struggle, man. <laughs> uh, I was, it was, everybody go- said no. Yeah. yeah for real. <laughs> I mean, that's the truth for about, for about, uh, you know, had an amazing, have an amazing manager. I had, uh, at the time a really, really good support group around me. Yeah. And, but at the same time I was, you know, I was working as a bull operator at a, at a Western themed, uh, bar and grill. And uh, I would bowl? go to. Did you say a bull operator? Bull operator. What's a bull? Oh, like you, a bull. An electronic bull. Oh, I thought you said like bowling. I'm <laughs> oh, like, what the yeah, hell no, is that? A bull okay, operator. A hey, bull you operator. Or, no, so bowling. Okay. Yeah, like, like a great. like a bull operator, and I, you know, people would get. Uh, would get inebriated and jump on the bull. Was that the Saddle bowl. Ranch? Yeah. Oh I didn't want to say it. I didn't want to say it because <laughs> I got fired. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Probably, I got fired. Probably they did you a favor though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did. Um, well, how did that happen? You they got, got fired? fired? Yeah. Uh, because I was really good at riding the bull without, uh, without hands. So I could do this thing. And one of my best friends in the world that's uh, Brock, uh, we ended up, we were, we st- remained friends See, ever this since. this is the stuff I want to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I would ride the bull without hands and try and entice people to get on. So I'd be like, everybody, and I'd have a, you know, microphone and be like, everybody get on the bull. And yeah. like, I, they'd be like, wow, how do you do that? And I'd be like, if you can ride it no hands, I'll get you a free drink. It was just a huge scam that I would run on people so that they would get on the bowl. Right. Because then if they get on the bowl, then they would, you know, they would get a free drink, but then the free drink would be like, oh, I'm going to stay and hang out because now it's just don't, you know, yeah, it's a manipulative I thing. I, I got it. Yeah. But hey, it's business. It's business <laughs> they, people. They told me to do it. Um, but yeah, but I, uh, I was very good friends with this other kid who ran the bowl with me and, um, I got fired because they were like, oh, you didn't fill out one of the forms. Every time I did it, I was supposed to fill out a form. Like, oh. who cares? But Well, I, we live in such a litigious society that, totally. you know, yeah. Oh, yeah. The thing would throw people across the room. Like, so it was who not don't, safe. For the listeners that don't know what the Saddle Ranch is, <laughs> so if you live in LA, it's been around a long time. It's mm-hmm. on Sunset Boulevard. It's a bar, food. It's very kitschy looking. Very it, kitschy. And they have an ele- electric bull in there and yeah. people get up and, yeah, they get drunk and they get on this bull and ride. Yeah. And I'll tell you the only reason that I know about the Saddle Ranch <laughs> is because for my engagement party. Oh, cool. 18 years ago. I don't know however long this was ago. My girlfriends took me to this place. I'm like, yeah. where are we going? Um, and uh, I did get drunk enough where I got on with a skirt and a dress. And yeah, I, yeah, you yeah. know, I was think I was cut because my, my mind, I'm like, I'm not going down. Oh, I'm get, I'm staying on this thing. You know, it was oh, all like man. mind over you matter. You were like my favorite kind of people. Yeah, I man, just be like, I was not going to get thrown <laughs> off. And, you know, you're stronger when you're drunk. Yeah, yeah, 
yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very true. So, so I think I remember that very clearly. I, I didn't feel it. I did eventually fall off. It was hilarious. And I woke up the next morning after the bachelorette party and I was hurting bad. Yeah. My head, my legs, everything. I'm like, never again. But it was fun. Yeah, it no, was it's, a story. It's, I want to make it really clear. I, I really, I did love that place for a couple of, of reasons. And the number one reason was it was always fun. It was always an experience. And yeah. I, you know, felt very wild, wild west when I was it there. It was the place to go like 15 years ago. I mean, yeah, it was yeah. Like hot, hot, hot. Very true. It yeah. was exact. And I think that's about the time that I was, uh, I was uh, right a, a little bit less. I think about like 12 years ago I was working there. Yeah. Um, but I was there, I did, you know, the bowl thing. And then I also had another job washing dishes yeah. at another place because I was just trying to like pay back my you student paid loans. You your dues. So this so, is, this is what acting's all about, right? Sort, You've sort got of. like 10, hey, you wouldn't remember this, but there was a funny sit, uh, there was a show called In Living Color in the Oh, 80s, my dad right? was on that show. And that, oh, well, there you go, yeah, right? Yeah. It, isn't that with J-Lo, the fly girl yeah, or whatever? Yeah, yeah. yeah, they had the fly girls and I watched the show Jim and there Perry was a, was on that too, I think. Who was? Jim Carrey was on it. At he one point. was. Yeah. They had this skit called "Hey Man, I've got 453 jobs, man," and he talks about these, <laughs> these, all these jobs he has. That's what it's like, people being an actor. Yeah, you yeah. got all these jobs to pay your loans and your bills, but yep. So then, so you got fired from that, and then how, how did you get this role? Well, so I, I got fired from that, and then I was still washing dishes, and you know, I got a call from it's my, and I was very, and it was, <laughs> at the, you know, what's so funny at the, at the time, and I want to be, be honest, my universe was so unrealized that yeah. I was like, I could do this. I don't have any problem. I'm like living my best life. I would skate over to work. I'd wash dishes. Right. I would be like, you're living the dream, living, man. Listening to music on this little broken <laughs> speaker. I'd be like, uh, like smoking a cigarette in the back, like just living my best life for real. Um, I got this call to, for this, for this, uh, pilot that uh -huh. was for, you know, a Sarah Shepard book. Um, I didn't know it was called Pretty Little Liars. I didn't know anything about it. And at first I went in for the role of Ren Kingston, which was this doctor. Mm hmm British and I went uh, in and I was like see if you would have known me I could have helped you, could you with help the me with accent. British accent well I so I had I a did, really I good British for accent 10 years. oh for real I grew up there oh there you go so there so so here's the I'm thing, not though. a dialect coach people but but British I could do <laughs> my assistant's British but She's I, losing her accent, but she has days where she puts it on heavier and you know, I'm like, don't lose your accent. We need you. Keep that accent, <laughs> Ella. I, I do, I do, uh, I do remember being really, really good at the accent oh, and okay. um, well, having that RP almost good. Like it was, it was so good that uh, the casting director, Gail Pillsbury, Bonnie Zane, they were like, oh, it's great. And then I, but here's the catch. When I was in there, I sat next to Julian Morris, who, uh, was amazing and ended up getting the role. Um, in fact, I think when I was done, I like called my, my manager called and he's like, how did it go? I said, it went great. It, it was between me and the guy who got it. Oh, <laughs> um, well, well, don't feel bad. We had Tom Ellison, who's Lucifer, right? Yeah. And, and I trained Tom, he sings on the show. And he told us this whole story about um, playing his first role as an American, because he mm -hmm. is British mm -hmm. and his accent was so terrible. They had to dub him and oh, it was just, yeah, it was, whoa, it, but it was, it's funny now. It but, wasn't yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's yeah, no, no, totally. Like you can laugh about that kind of stuff like way later. And yeah. Be like, yeah, yeah. But I then he from did that. a fabulous American <laughs> accent for us years later. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah, he's amazing. Um, but yeah, so I went in, did that, mm -hmm. and met Julian. And then I didn't get it, obviously. And then a couple months went by, and I got the sides for Toby Cavanaugh, and I kind of read it on my way over. I it was funny how how like life is, where I was just like, you know what. This doesn't. I was like, this isn't going to define me. This this audition doesn't define who I am. <laughs> it's like such a foreshadowing. It doesn't define who I am. Like it's not who. It's not like it doesn't mean anything to me. I'm just going to go and have fun with it. And I well, skateboarded that's the over. Well, attitude you should have anyway. I know, and I is a learning experience. Uh, went over and um, just had a great read, and then left, and then ended up booking it. And it was supposed to be a small guest star role for six episodes. It ended up being seven years of, you know just incredible dynamic character changes. And we just had Sarah Drew things. on from a Grey's Anatomy. Yeah. She had the same story. Wow. She's like, Grey's I was Anatomy. only supposed to be a guest star. And you know, like how many wow. years later I, I was still on. So yeah, you yeah. never know. You know, for real. And so that, and that kind of helped me and allowed me to do everything that I've ever wanted to do. And has afforded me like the, uh, the ability to influence people through, you know, campaigns and philanthropic, uh, um, organizations and also follow my passions in photography and music as mm -hmm. well. And so, 
Um, and it's been, it was a wonderful experience. I, I still, I, I mean, the, the show is now in a spinoff on, oh. um, on uh, Freeform okay. now with Sophia Carson, Janelle Parrish, uh, Sasha Peterse. And uh, I don't it's, know who any of those people they're, they're, are. They were so. So Sophia Carson was was a. Uh, I'm going to be totally honest. <laughs> Sophia Carson, I, I, th- I think she did the Disney Descendants, and then oh, had okay. this huge following from Disney Channel, and then now they have her on there, and she's incredible. Her voice is like whoa, and her, yeah. she's a good sing. She's a great singer. Um, but uh, I live and, under a rock now. I just train my clients. Actually, and- all of the people that are on the show sing. I just realized Sasha sings, Janelle sings, everybody sings. But what I'm saying is, I am not. I'm not affiliated with the new show, but I, I watched it. I think it's great. Um, and it was such an, an amazing part of, of my chapter of my acting career because mm-hmm. it gave me so much insight of what it, what a TV show could be, what it is, what it, what, like all the dynamics of the a business. huge following. Yeah. I know that it was just like, you know, yeah. very popular. Yeah. Uh, how many, how long, how many seasons were you on? Uh, I think it's seven seasons and yeah. uh, is in over a hundred episodes, maybe wow. almost closer to 200 episodes. But, um, but it was a really interesting experience. And, right. um, and since then I've always been, uh, and, and even during that, I, I've, I'm always leaning towards more uh, like roles that are, that are about real people. Mm-hmm. Um, so recently I just played a, a vlog, like a vlogger. Um, in this movie and uh, that was a really ex- exciting experience um, because that's such a new forum mm-hmm. of, of entertainment to be it a is. YouTube ce- YouTube celebrity is one thing but to be like a vlogger now to go on and have people know who you really are or who at least who you present yourself to be but it's you it's not a character mm-hmm. even if it is right it's still like y- these these kids that are they have huge followings like massive more than like they're just as recognizable as someone like Leonardo DiCaprio it's, or Meryl Streep. It's disturbing yeah. in a way, but I don't know. We, we talk, that's another string that we talk about in almost every episode. It's a love hate. Yeah. The whole Instagram, we could talk about that for years, but yeah. we won't get into that. It, it, it's just, you know, a necessary evil, I think now. Yeah. But you, you're just in it and on it all the time. You yes. know? So you just, you have to look at it as, as, as sort of an art form that's coming up and, and this generation is, is watching that. Yes. So it is very interesting if you can do something, something kind of cool with that. Yeah. But I know, um, wrapping up, it's, it's in, it's so great to, have you on not just as an actor but as a singer and as a musician and i personally hope that you'll continue building that craft because Mm -hmm. for for our listeners that haven't heard keegan sing i mean he's got a beautiful voice you have a beautiful voice and it's just you got to put the training in it's just like in the gym you know or being an athlete or training for the olympics or for for something Mm -hmm. uh, even just a marathon you have to put the time in and you'll get better and better and better and more and more confident have taken some actors who started with that attitude and they're doing Broadway now. Yeah. You know, yeah. so you just don't know where you can go. And um, it will be interesting to, to have you back at some time because I know you're working on something kind of cool right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on the down low. Um, so, you know, it'll be nice when that comes to fruition and we can maybe have you back at some time in the future and talk about yeah. the cool stuff and where your your process um, where that. your process is now. So yeah. I love that we finally got you here. It was tough, you. you know, we're all so busy and, and I'm glad that you can make time for us to to sit here and talk on lip roll. So Anytime. thanks Keegan. Very, very yeah. pleased to we'll be here. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to Lip Roll. I'm your host, Valerie Morehouse. And I'm just so excited because we just had Keegan Allen on the show and it was great listening to everything he had to say. Yeah. And um, I have to say I think I would be okay if he read some poetry to me. You I know, think he would he be too. The poetry part, yeah, I, like, yeah. yes, I wouldn't mind okay, that either. So next Could you time <laughs> we have to have him like read some Bob Dylan lyrics Deep or something. Thoughts Deep with thoughts. Keegan Allen. Dun, yes. dun, dun, dun. I love it. New show. Yes, exactly. Um, he, it was fun. It was I've, really fun. There's so, there's so much so about much. him I don't know. You totally went rogue on the interview. It's like I we're did. sitting back here and it was so great just hearing you guys just bounce off each other. It's and my all thing. The great I can things. never stay on topic because then something <laughs> really interesting comes up and I just have to go. You know? Right. I'm like, highlight it in yellow. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing everything's run. I'm like, I, that, that's not there. I'm just going to do what I want I'm just anyway. Do what I do. <laughs> yeah. You, you've earned the nickname of rogue um, interviewer. Um, but no, I love it. And Keegan, I think one of the parts about his story that I didn't realize was that all of the backstory 
pre pretty little lives right. and all of the working and the washing dishes that was I, fun you know, i thought it was the great. saddle ranch was a the saddle funnest. ranch i'm like oh my goodness that brought back memories, memories. big big memories and his parents yeah. being are art, art, artists, artists and, as yeah. well and just the whole background and the reality is is there's a lot of rejection in this city right so it's a lot of working really really hard and um don't ever yeah. give up don't ever give up that's it be yourself be your voice be you that's it and while you're at it go subscribe to us on youtube youtube <laughs> just you know, wait for boom. it boom. youtube what boom. else do we have um, instagram, instagram twitter facebook um all the socials all the socials oh and of course where the podcast is apple at and lip, yes i'll and, let you say it and spotify time. oh well yes at liproll.co on instagram you're like perfect blah, 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 blah. <laughs> we'll just lip sync you in there <laughs> perfect <laughs> All right. What did we miss? We missed something huge. We missed huge. something huge, oh, which was class, class 14. 14. And I want to make a point there that it's class 14. I feel bad. I need to get up on my names, but it's class 14. We're really excited to have them on the show and sponsoring yeah. our game, yeah. Real or Fake, which was super fun. And you totally lost. Thank you. Mwah, mwah, mwah. I, I did. <laughs> I totally lost. But thank you to class 14 for, for sponsoring us. That was it's the most fun part we have of the day. So we Definitely. appreciate it. It was great. Yeah. Yay. Yay. <laughs>